joining. So, yep, I'm Benjamin Kabe. I work at Sierra Wireless. We do machine to machine and Internet of Things. Basically, this is wireless modems, 2G, 3G, 4G, and the cloud platform. And today I want to talk about open source and open APIs for the Internet of Things. So I would like to start with a quote from someone you may know. Uh, creativity is just connecting things. Just connecting things. Well, this is something that uh, we kind of do already, right? This is the internet, uh, connecting things, ideas for enabling creativity, having platform to share uh, pictures, to share words with blogs, with Tumblr, WordPress, whatever. Even more recently, uh, sharing, like you have this crazy idea in your garage and you want to, to build a business, to build an actual object and maybe a business out of it, you can you know, do crowdfunding and stuff like that with Kickstarter, Rule, whatever. So this is something that is actually not really new. We've been doing this forever, right? Just before Rafi was talking about all these smartphones that allow to connect with our objects and with each other. But if you think about it, we've been creative forever by connecting with each other. The wheel, without the wheel, would we know about commerce, uh, for example? Without navigation, all these beautiful ancient maps, we wouldn't have them, right? It's because we've been able to connect with, with each other that way. <coughs> and more recently, um, something like, like the telegraph, the electric telegraph, it's allowed um, people to communicate with each other and it's allowed also to have news reach us before they became history already, right? Be before the telegraph, if, if you had to wait for, for a wire to, to reach, uh, to reach uh, the, the, the end consumer, it would take days, right? So talking about the electric telegraph, one thing that is um, uh, important about it is that right from the beginning, actually, it was a closed invention, right? In, in the mid uh, 19th century, the, the telegraph was a patented invention. It means that if you wanted to be creative about and with this new way of communicating with, uh, with the world, then you couldn't really hack the telegraph to build on top of it. And without this, the fact that it was closed, I think that the telephone and maybe the internet, we would have known it uh, even uh, earlier. Well, actually, to be completely transparent, um, uh, the fact that the telegraph was closed was also a way for people to be creative. I don't know if you know this, but the, um, the, um, the, the press agency, AP, Associated Press, was actually invented because the telegraph was such an expensive way of communicating that they, uh, several um, uh, newspapers from, from New York City partnered with each other to, to actually share the, the, the communication network uh, to, uh, and to actually send their, 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 press, uh, their press stuff uh, that way. So, yeah, this is, um, this is kind of the history. And um, if you think about what we do now and what, we can, what, what is our future with all these things that we are now able to connect with each other, we enable use cases like what you may know, um, uh, it's becoming more and more popular, it's called smart grid, the ability for electricity company to optimize the distribution of electricity according to the actual consumption uh, of electricity in the buildings, in the households. Um, delivery, I mean, uh, we could be really creative about that, right? Um, how about FedEx being able to deliver uh, or, or, uh, or another um, a carrier being able to deliver a package not only based on your address, but uh, based on where you actually stand at the time the, 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 the delivered truck is, is, is next to you, right? Um, cars, electric, electric cars, you want to find a charging, sta charging station available in the city, you want to receive an SMS uh, when the, the, your car is charged. That's also one of the, of the, the cool use cases around the, the Internet of Things. Um, everything related to health care. I mean, Rafi told about it, about these uh, smart pill boxes and, and, and stuff like that to enable uh, doctors to have access to, uh, to uh, crucial information uh, faster, earlier to, 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 do their, to do their stuff. Well, this is, the problem is that it's not really easy uh, today to build solutions. 
Of course, there are already Internet of Things solutions. You may have uh, home automation uh, solutions at home for controlling your alarm system and stuff like that. But the market is really fragmented. You have lots of verticals, lots of proprietary solutions, um, proprietary protocols. You need to, uh, to um, I mean, several programming languages and stuff. So this is really fragmented. This is also complex when you do Internet of Things. Usually you, you need to deal with embedded devices, constrained devices. So it means that you will have to learn some kind of uh, embedded uh, programming language. You will need to do some network at some point. You'll need to, to communicate over uh, SMSs, over wireless networks. So this is really complex. And um, the, probably the, the most important problem is that there is a strong lock-in syndrome, right? When you buy an home automation, home automation solution, it's very likely that you don't really have access to the data that's being transmitted. You don't really know about all the protocols you need to, to use the solution coming from a specific provider. And this is not cool, right? Um, especially since you, um, if, if you think about uh, the, all the projections about all these billions div of devices that will be connected in, in the next decade or so. But openness is not really an option uh, for, for, for us as a species, I would say. We are doomed if the Internet of Things is not opened. Uh, as a recent example, a couple of months ago, you may have seen this um, in, in the news, um, a couple of parents in, um, in Houston, Texas, uh, they, they went into the, the bedroom of their two years old daughter and there was, they, they had a, a, um, an IP camera for monitoring what, what was happening with the baby and stuff. And when they entered the room, some guy was actually talking and swearing at the child uh, just because he hacked into the system. And because, yeah, this solution wasn't really based on open source, open standards, and it was probably something that was kind of easy to hack. So I'm not, I mean, trying to spread FUD here. It's just about telling you that, yeah, we need to have open options. Well, how does the Internet of Things work uh, from, a, from an high level perspective? What you want to do is, conceptually, this is very simple, right? You have some actors, human or uh, more automated ones, that want to interact with objects. And we call it the Internet of Things because what you want to do is to send commands, post commands to the, to the objects to, to control them, and you want to retrieve data, right? You want to get the temperature of a kettle and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm sorry. It's called the Internet of Things, but as of today, this is not really how it works. This is uh, how it works on, on the paper, but even, I mean, even if we had IPv6 everywhere and stuff, the way the network is, is built, it's just not possible to have every, uh, every human in the world being able to talk to, to an object directly. There is, um, um, in between, there is a cloud that will, uh, that will act uh, as, um, as the interface between the objects and, um, and, the, um, and the rest of the world. So that means that we have actually kind of two set of APIs for objects to communicate, and these are these two sets that, in my opinion, need, needs to be open. On one hand, you have what, uh, what I would call the sensor, uh, sensor network, uh, for which you have um, strong constraints in terms of uh, the fact that the network is probably very unreliable. You, you rely on 2G, 3G, um, some kind of wireless RF. So the, the network is constrained. So the, the way your sensors will talk with the, with the internet, with the cloud, uh, you will need to have protocols that can deal with that. You also need to, to address the fact that you want to do many-to-many -many communications in that the sensors, if possible, that would be great if they could talk to each other. Um, uh, you know, if they are on the same network, they need to be able to interact with, with each other. And then on the other end of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the server, there will be us plus all the applications that you want to build using, using the data. And here, uh, some of the, the constraints, some of the requirements are the fact that you need to address the identity. This is not all the, I mean, the sensors by themselves, they, will, they don't know who they belong to and who has access to what, uh, to what data, etc. So you need uh, a server to manage that kind of stuff. You need, of, uh, also, we've seen, that we, we've seen that with Matthias, you need security, you need to be able to, to secure your communications, um, knowing that most of the times on the sensor or network side, the, um, yeah, you are on some kind of trusted network, so security is, uh, is an issue as well, but it's not uh, uh, as critical. And wha what you need in the end is really to be able to consume all the data flow coming from the sensors, and all these, uh, all these data, they are 
they are yours, so you need to be able to consume them and to have open APIs for consuming them. So sensor network. Um, I want to talk about um, a cool open source technology for doing actual communications uh, between sensors and the cloud and the internet, which is called MQTT. Matthias talked about MQTT earlier. This is a protocol uh, which stands for Message Queue Telemetry Transport for doing messaging, messaging for sensors. That means being able to communicate over TCP with a very, very small overhead, uh, being able to communicate and in a way that is um, um, publish subscribe based. It means that your sensor, they, they will publish data on specific topics and uh, the server will receive the data and according to who is registered, uh, who wants to consume the data, you will be able to, uh, to dispatch the, the data that, that way. So yeah, it's very lightweight. This is really important when you do, when you do Internet of Things. You, you rely on wireless networks, bandwidth costs money, so you need to, to, to save bandwidth. And it's an open protocol. Open as in the specification is open. Uh, not only it's a very simple specification, like if you want to hack uh, on a weekend and implement your own version of, of MQTT, uh, you can do so. It's just um, a few, uh, yeah, probably like 10 pages or so. But actually, even if you want to hack and implement the protocol yourself, it's very likely that there is an implementation available already. There is an implementation of MQTT in pretty much every language, uh, programming language you could think of. And they, uh, these, most of these implementations, they live under um, an initiative, which we can talk about uh, after the session offline if you want to, which is um, at the Eclipse Foundation, the uh, Eclipse Open Source Foundation. There are several open source projects for doing Internet of Things, and two of them are uh, related to, uh, to MQTT. One is PAHO, it's where all the clients are available and Mosquito is about the broker, the server side implementation. So if you want to build a solution on top of MQTT, you have all the open source um, implementations available as part of uh, these projects and as part of Eclipse M2M. So that is for the sensor network. And then now that our uh, things can talk, uh, how can we consume the data? Well, we have MQTT, we could consume the data directly. We can. I mean, we could also have other kind of um, technology running on the sensors, HTTP, co-op, whatever, and we could consume the data directly, right? But the problem is that because we do wireless, because the sensors are usually battery powered, they are constrained, they are, to make the, the long story short, they are not always connected, the communication will be asynchronous. So you, it means that you need to have some ways of uh, caching the data and consolidating the data, et cetera, as we've seen with, with Matthias earlier. So when it comes to, um, to consuming the data from, uh, for, for us people and for building our, our, all our applications, you need a cloud, uh, as I said. So in, in our case at Sierra, that would be an advantage, but this is not the point here. The point is really to highlight what are all the, um, the requirements you need to fulfill when you want to provide an open API for your um, customers to build their solutions and still be also able to move from one solution to the other. If they want to, to, to switch from one cloud offer to the other, they need to still be able to, to, um, to have their sensors available to talk to the server and they need to still be able to retrieve all the data they've been sending so far. So one of the few things that the server needs to take care of uh, that will be managing the users, as I said, sensors are pretty dumb. They don't know about who has access to what, so you need to uh, to, to, to model in your server what are the access rights, what are the relationships with all the sensors, uh, who uh, can see uh, what, et cetera, et cetera. You need to do one important thing uh, for the, uh, the people who actually operate the solutions on the field, not necessarily for, for, for you as an end user, but you need to do what we call device management. What is the battery level? What is the signal quality of all my devices on the field? Um, uh, can I update the, the software that is embedded on my sensors? Well, this is one of the things that uh, um, an IoT cloud needs to take care of. Then comes, of course, data management, and it's, uh, it's about being able to have a representation of the data even if the sensors is offline, um, being able to consolidate the data as we've seen earlier, being able to, to have uh, standard deviations, whatever, being able to do queries, uh, geo, uh, geo queries, Streaming, just like for, for Twitter, where you can consume all the tweets that come from, from the Twitter uh, world timeline. Same for data. Uh, it's great to be able to consume all the data that is flowing from all the sensors. 
And last but not least, you need to enable application management, uh, enable your, your customers to, to, to declare new applications, to have OAuth for the security, uh, deal with maybe rate limiting so as you can still be scalable when it comes to, to operating uh, thousands of, uh, uh, of, um, of sensors on the field. So that's pretty much the, 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 the picture. And I want to do a, a quick demo, and you may have figured out that we have this, uh, this guy over here, and this is, this is the demo that I have uh, for you. And by the way, you've been, you've, you haven't been tweeting a lot, because this is actually tweets. We have a Raspberry Pi, uh, which is here, and that is communicating with a, um, an LED RGB strip uh, over a, um, a, a dedicated uh, local, uh, local um, wired uh, protocol. So the, the Raspberry Pi will be what I would call my communicating device. The, the LED strip is actually the, the actual thing I, I'd like to, to, to interact with from my, my server. So on the Raspberry Pi, I run a PAHO uh, MQTT implementation. In my case, that is a Node.js uh, version. So if you want to see the source code afterwards, I'd be very happy to show you. It's just a few lines of code for, um, for communicating using MQTT. And the other actor in my solution, at least the main actor, uh, other actors would be actually you uh, tweeting. Uh, the other actor is a, is a bot uh, that I developed using Ruby and using another very cool API I just mentioned earlier, the Twitter streaming API. So this um, bot uh, written in Ruby, uh, FYI, is consuming all the tweets that uh, have the um, API days hashtag. And whenever there is some uh, a tweet like this, what the robot will do is send a command to, uh, to the server so as whenever the thing is actually visible, which in my case is all the time, I'm using a wired communication, but maybe uh, the communication could be less reliable. Whenever my object, my thing, will be uh, available, then I will push an MQTT command so as there is a new pixel that is uh, pushed to the LED strip. So it's a slightly simplified version of how the APIs look like uh, for, for advantage, but the idea is really that you want to talk to um, via a specific communication device, you want to reach a specific object, send a specific command, some parameters, in my case that would be uh, a color name, uh, if, if there is one. Uh, and now you can try it. Uh, so if you tweet using the API days hashtag, or uh, if you actually mention my, my Twitter um, nickname, there uh, something pretty cool will happen, but I'm wondering if it's actually running because it's been pretty slow, right? So let me just double check. Well, yeah, I think it's, so there must be a blinking, there's not, hmm. So this part is okay. Okay, you can tweet again. This is not a ploy for you guys to, to, to tweet a lot. Well, maybe it is. Okay, so this is someone who probably mentioned my uh, Twitter um, handle. And the, the cool thing also is that if you actually mention a color name in your tweet, as in uh, HTML uh, color name, red, blue, lime, purple, whatever, uh, this should also control the actual color of the of the pixel. So that is uh, the demo I had for you. Um, I hope this is uh, something that has shown you what it means to use open APIs for being creative. I hope this is one uh, one uh, cool idea uh, for 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 being creative. And yeah, remember, openness is just not an option when it comes to. Being able to communicate with all the objects around us, we need to have open protocols and open APIs for doing that. So please uh, reach out to me after the session if you have questions, if you want to check all the projects that we have around machine-to-machine uh, -machine and IoT at the Eclipse Foundation. This is on m2m.eclipse.org, and if you want to uh, try our platform, there is a link as well. And with that, I will answer your questions if you have any. <laughs>